אוקיי, רבותיי. פרשת, פרשת בו, בשירתה דשמיא. פרשת בו, discusses the continuation of the מכות in מצרים. פרשת ואירא, there was seven plagues. ואירא, וו, א', is seven. That's how you remember it. בו, how much? בית is two, א' is one. Three. Three. I remember it. Bo has three plagues. Seven and three is ten. We discussed the ten plagues. We once went through it thoroughly, the different the drashim that talk about the ten uh, makot that Bore Olam gave in Egypt. And there's a mitzvah in this perasha that says every father has an obligation to tell his son, Asa Hashem li Resetim in Israel You have an obligation to tell your children What happened When the Jewish people left Egypt And what Borei Olam did The miracles And to teach him And to give him a thorough shiur On the night of Pesach Exactly what happened In Kla Yisrael In general In general A father has an obligation To Not only to tell his son this story, but it rests upon the father. You know, some of you guys are single and not even married yet without kids, but there'll be a toilet for you. There'll be a benefit for you to understand these concepts. The concept called chinuch. Chinuch is raising children. Chinuch is bringing up children. Teaching your sons, not only physically, <coughs> Not only teaching them a trade, not only teaching them to earn a livelihood, teach them mathematics and history and how to walk and how to talk. It's an obligation on a father to teach his son about his lineage, about his religion, about his Torah, to teach what he learned from his father. To give it over to his son with a little extra from what he knows. So that son will be able to continue the great golden chain that starts from Moshe Rabbeinu all the way down to the end of time. And if the child is not going to know all about our religion and all about God and all about our Torah, The chain is broken, Has Shalom. And if the chain breaks, who is going to give it over to the next generation? Has Shalom, there goes our religion. So the responsibility of Chinuch, the responsibility in bringing up children and raising children in the Torah way, is a monumental feat. It is a tremendous job. It should not be taken lightly. It's... Ironic that you have sometimes an 18-year-old, a 19-year-old, just got married, he has a baby. Such a young boy, such young parents with such a tremendous responsibility in raising the child in a Torah way in order to keep the pure, unbroken link from Moshe Rabbeinu. And this... This is the big question. How do you give Hinuch to your children? How do you do it? We all know you have a mitzvah, Hinuch. You've got to raise children. You've got to teach your children. You've got to bring them up. How do you raise children? Now, I'm not going to sit here tonight and profess to be a child psychologist and one of these counselors over here that's going to start giving advice. I'm also new at the job. My wife, A couple of weeks ago, I have a daughter, Baruch Hashem, and she was acting something, I don't know, uh, a certain funny way. So my wife uh, called up one of her friends from Israel and asked her, yeah, what do you do when your kid uh, acts like this? What do you do? She says, uh, are you uh, reading any books? 
books is this? What do you do? Like, how do you act? What do you tell her? What do you do? He says, oh, she says, you're all going to give Hinuch to your children and you didn't read any books about how to give Hinuch? So what subject in the world can a person ever master unless he studies it? Can a person become a doctor without going to school to read books about how to become a doctor? Can a person become a lawyer without going to school? How can a person even think to train a child, to teach a child, if he never read what the child thinks and what goes to a child's mind and how a child reacts and sometimes when your child you tell a child don't do this all the child is is do this you have to know the tricks and if you're not going to read up on it and if you're not going to study it and you're not going to analyze how in the world can a person go blindly and say like a fool and say don't worry about it I'll wing it I'll handle it I'll figure it out you wouldn't want to go to a doctor that learn medicine that way. So oh, we'll cut you open. We'll figure it out. Here's the heart. Here's the liver. Oh, we'll look at it. What's, what could be so hard? We'll figure. You wouldn't hire a lawyer like that. So oh, we'll go to the court. We'll wing it. We'll see what he says. Now I'll figure so. Anything that you want to do the right way, you need preparation. And if I'm telling you that bringing up children is probably the most important job that a father, especially. Because the father has an obligation to teach his child Torah and raise him up in a religious way. Probably the most important job all you fellas have is that to shame the ones who have children, the ones who are going to have children. Your main goal in life is going to be like the Torah says, Urvu, be fruitful and multiply. And one rabbi says, Urvu not only means multiply, but the word Urvu also comes from the the word to aim, and in Hebrew they call it an arrow, or an aviyaz, or an aviyaz, an arrow, which means you'll have an obligation, peru urvu, to be fruitful, and to give your children direction, to aim them, to direct them like an arrow, you direct it, you have to direct the children, that's your most important job in life, and that responsibility is on the parent, and if you're not going to study the subject, I was an eyeclist, Bookstore on Coney Island there, Hanukkah, we had a day off in the Kolel. I like to spend my day off, so I like to go to the bookstores. Look, the Brasto Nusifarim, the very big Hanukkah, very big pleasure in general, whenever you have a day off of work, go and browse to a bookstore, a Jewish bookstore, not a Barnes and Nobles, I'm talking about that. Barnes and Nobles, yeah, might be a question if you can browse through some of those things. I'm talking about Eichler's, all the books are good, kosher books. You look, they have English, they have Hebrew. Aramaic, whatever language you want to have. You go and you see the different books. I picked up one book from a great rabbi living today in Asia, Sherba, Shlomo Volba. Unbelievable. He is probably the man of Musad of our generation, without a question. But what I mean, the man of our generation, he understands the generation. He's not giving you Musad. You know, in Europe, 200 years ago, that generation was. He's giving you 1996 with the children on, with the kids on, what the world is. He's giving you the Musar, the way it's supposed to be for our generation. Very, very big, 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 a wise man, but understands people. And he happened to have a little sample over there. A little small little book, man. Picked it up, start looking through it. Chinuch Abanim. And he's giving you practical advice. What to say, what to do, what not to do, and how to do. I said, well, at first, at first I thought, well, what is this here? Got to tell people how to raise their kids. We're not a race kid. Don't worry, you have a kid. You tell them, don't do this, don't eat that. This is too hot, this is too cold, this is healthy, this is not healthy. What? What's to know? And then he on the first page of the book, he says, to, to knock me, to throw me out the window, he says, many people think, what do you need this book for? You know, yeah. People think it's so easy to raise children. It's not so easy. And this is, this is a, a little book that gives you the synopsis of the classes he gave in Israel to his students, parents, who also had children needed advice how to raise children. So from there, and from that conversation that my wife had with a friend in Israel, I realized that Hainuch is a very big subject, and it is a point to give it the proper time and the proper study in order that we could, after all that, does that Hashem do uh, a decent job? And there's two ways, there's two approaches in Hinuch. Some of us are familiar with the approaches. 
it's one approach is you have to be very tough on the kid. You have to demand. And you have to pressure him. And you have to push him all the way. Some of you people had teachers in school that used to be very tough and used to scream and eh, they were very, very demanding. That's one derech. They say if you leave the kid to do what he wants to do, he's not going to do nothing. If you don't pressure him and you don't be tough on the kid, you're not going to get results. Another approach is, no, what are you doing? Especially in our generation, you do that to a kid, you're going to hit a three-year-old, you're going to hit a six-year-old, what's the kid going to do? He'll hit you right back! He'll hit you back! You know, there's a sin in the Torah called the Fnei Ved Lotitem Nechshol. Am I allowed to put you in a situation where for sure you're going to make a sin? A father that might hit a six-year-old today, the six-year-old might hit him right back. So you cause your son to make a sin. You put him in a situation where he's going to hit you back. So, there's another approach. Should you hit your kids? Generally speaking, they say, hitting is very ineffective. Especially if you have like, a father that comes home from a hard day at work, and he's angry at the boss, and he missed the train, and it's raining, and uh, he ripped his suit, and the kid comes home, and hey, father's in a bad mood, and the kid said the wrong thing on the wrong night, and the father takes the kid dark, and uh, he's really hitting his boss. He's really hitting the F train. But meanwhile, the kid's crying his head off. He's beating up the kid. So, hitting the kid in frustration is for sure. Everyone agrees it's not good. But even in general, the method in hitting the kid, many people misconstrue Shalomo's words that says, One that spares the rod hates his kid. He's not talking about a stick. Certain times, a, 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 a sharp look at a kid is like a rod. It's like a stick. Sometimes the kids walk out, you just look at them. We had rabbis in school, never raised their voice. It's very serious, would look, and you say, uh oh, your heart would just fall out of your face. Uh oh, so, oh, oh, oh boy, he's angry. Oh, you start shaking. He would even talk lower when he's angry. So, oh, oh, yeah, forget it. I hear him, I hear him. It was, yeah. So that, that, that's the method, that's the technique. But just to beat the kid and to hit the kid, so, so now you gotta know that. Now, a regular parent that goes into his cold, hitting's good, what do you mean we'll teach the kid to? And who knows, this rabbi claims in the book, and you hit the kid, and now you think it's the easy way out. You hit him, he shuts up. You hit him, he kept quiet. You hit him, he does. When he turns 15, 16 years old, you'll pay for those hits. When the kid starts rebelling against you, it's in the kid already. So when the kid starts to go against the fight, what, what is that? Oh, those are the hits that you gave the kid when he was four, five, six, whatever it is. So there's an approach there. One approach is, you know, it's with the words, it's with the looks, it's with the talking, it's with... But, you know, don't, and let him, give him some breathing room, because if you're not going to give him his breathing room, he's going to rebel. So, there's methods. Open up an Ambam. That Ambam writes to one of the mass, about one of the master educators. Anybody know who one of the master educators in this world was? One of the master educators was Abraham Abinu. He writes over here about Abraham. The way he used to bring back people to religion. The people would gather. They would question him. Abraham, Rabbi Abraham, what does this mean? What does that mean? Just like a little boy. They have little kids, they can ask you 150 questions. Questions that you wouldn't even have to answer. As an airplane fly, an airplane fly. I don't know how it flies. A bird, as a bird fly. I don't know. Keep on asking your question. They were asking Abraham questions. And he would answer everybody according to his knowledge. You want to according to his level. He would answer them. The wise one, give an intellectual answer. The less one. A little less. And the lesser one, a little story. Give him an example. Your father has to know that in, in, in training a child. Not every child has an IQ of 150. And not every uh, child is uh, Rosh Shiva quality. So if he's going to start giving his son a whole discourse from Misinati Sharim, why he should get up early for Minyan, because a certain child, Zidi Zud, then you have to get up for the Minyan, and then give him a whole Musad lecture, and give him four tapes to listen to on the subject. Okay, the kid don't know you. You just tell the kid, get up in the morning, I'll give you a lollipop. Ah, oh, okay, I'll get up. You're hitting him with Misinati Sharim when you could have solved the problem with a lollipop. 
uh, uh, a little older, then already he can go with a different approach. Like, if he not all. Abraham Abinu didn't make one speech in front of everybody. He used to have, you know, the A class, and the B class, and the C class, and the D class. Everyone would, would, would get what they needed. But you're not going to tell the guy up here, well, give him a lower answer than I am. Don't mix it up. You feed the ator. The Rambam elaborates on this subject in Hilchot Hametzu Matzah. You forgive me, I don't have my glasses on, so I'm really struggling to read these words here. But the Rambam is in Hilchot Hametzu Matzah, Perek Zayin Halacha Bet. The Rambam says, Mitzvah Lehotia Lebanim. It's to tell the children about Yitziat Mitzrayim, Afidu lo sha'alo. It's two types of kids. One night, one type of kid on the night of Pesach says, Dad, what are we doing over here? What's that haroset over there? We never have haroset. What's this matzo? Where's the Syrian bread? What's the, uh, what's the celery dipping business? Certain kids are inquisitive. They ask the father right away. So the father psyched that money. Shana, the kid asks, okay. Sometimes you have a kid. Sometimes you have a kid. Sister. Okay, nothing. He's looking. He's watching. He's waiting to eat the haroset. Okay, you don't want to. You don't want his questions. You don't want nothing. He's waiting for the shank bone. Meanwhile, the father has to tell the kid. Now, Bram said, "I feel the law." You got to tell the kid. You got to tell the kid. The feed the atoshil ben. According to the wisdom of the son, Abid Melamido. Same subject. We could talk about Yisiyat Misraim and open up a Zohar and talk about the Zohar aspect. Ariyesh would love to hear that. Ariyesh is a good method. But to go tell your little child, you know what the Zohar says about Yisiyat Misraim, who the Gilgul of Paro was and how it worked according to the Sefirot with the Tikkunim. With you can sit in there. And even to go in depth and start answering questions. and That's what happens some nights the night of Pesach. People get lost. And I mentioned this on another tape. People get lost on the night of Pesach. Everybody prepares for all the Hindusim. And they come to the table. And everybody wants to mix up everybody. I have a question and an answer. And we can say this and we can say that. With the thumbs and the inside and the outside. Meanwhile, the Omid was what? To tell the kids what happened in Egypt. Meanwhile, the kids sitting there. Watching the father jump up and down out of his chair, answering, and there's a question, his answer, he's giving a whole uh, philosophy shiur on Egypt. The kid don't even know what happened. And what Rambam says, the feed al Talk like a six-year-old. Talk to a four-year-old. Talk to a ten-year-old. Go down to the level of the child. Kids, he tells you. I don't know. I'm going to tell you what to do. Im hayat katan o tipesh. Unbelievable. You'd say, the kid's a tipesh. Leave him. A4. Go to sleep. Here's a lollipop. Kish. Tipesh. I'm not telling nothing. The father says, no. No, chinuch and a tipesh? There's chinuch and a tipesh. The kid's a little slow, so you teach the kid. Now, Omer lo, Beni. Oh, my son. Kulan wa yinu avadim. We were all slaves. Kemoshif Hazu. You point to the Khadami. You see the Khadami over there in the kitchen? We were like this and we were like that. Okay, no, example, live example. Oh, yeah, we, we were all made in that. Egypt. We were cleaning dishes. Like, yeah, yeah, but the old guy, we were amazed. Okay, more Ibbits there. You point to the butler. I don't realize the butler. Okay, more Ibbits there, Miss Ryan. Malayla, there. And then this night, Adal, Tara, Kadosh, Barakum, Yatsun, Hadu. The Imayat bin Gadol, the child's older, the Hacha, you tell him a little more. Shavano, miracles, and you go a little deeper. So we're seeing here, according to the Rambam, that Chinuch really varies according to the child. And a father has to discern each child. And in one family you can have brilliant ones, and you can have mediocre ones, and you, can, and you can't expect the brilliant one. And the weaker one to be like the brilliant one. And if the, if the weaker one brings home a 70 in school, on his level that's considered 105. And if the brilliant one brings home a, 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 a 75, there might be a problem because he's capable. And he's not capable. A parent has to know that. You see, Dato'shilden, according to the wisdom of the son, the father has to 
train him. And one must be very persistent in Hanukkah and not give up. So I told you the story. Man. Who was the king of Egypt? Haman! I told you about all. It's not something this kid's not going to learn already. What country we were in? Tadasu Madai! Tadasu Madai, you're mixing up, that's making up this. Oh, you know something? Again, the kid's never going to see, you something? When he gets older, I'll teach him and then leave it. Or is it going to give up in Hanukkah? Just like in anything in life, just like in business, you have a good day, a bad day, you're in a rut, you have another bad day, well, I'm not going to work anymore the rest of my life, forget it, business stinks, I'm still asleep all day. You can't give up, especially on this. The father puts his effort into it slowly with pay. it's not so easy to be patient in these subjects, but if a person builds up his patient and is persistent, slowly, slowly, you'll see results. Father should not say, who am I to tell my son what to do? Father, I was once teaching him to an ah. He says, well, who am I to tell my uh, my son what to do? I don't want to, and it's not, it's not respectful for the kid, it's not careful. That's false, false uh, humility, using his humility in the wrong time. Father should realize his responsibility. And not say, who am I to give Musar to somebody? I myself am not so good. I myself, when I was, uh, when I was young, I also used to do these bad things. So how can I tell my son to do something that I myself did when I was young? Ah, he'll grow up, he'll learn. So he should make the same mistakes and he should go through the same kaparat abunot that you went through when you were a kid. And who knows if he's going to come out of it like you came out of it. You went through the maze already of life. You saw the pitfalls. The job of the father is to tell us that this is wrong. You're not. No, I, you should, but you did it yourself. It doesn't matter. I learned. I was wrong. I want better for you. One should not be afraid to give his son Musar. We see in Tanakh several instances where there were parents that did not give their sons Musar. The famous Eli HaKohen. The Pasuk says, about Eliyah Kohen, me gati lo, what the Olam says, go tell Eli, ki shofet ani et beto ad Olam. Judges family forever, for eternity, the family of Eli is going to be judged. Eli is the Kohanim family. The Tawil family. You know, the Tawil, the wheel family in our community claim that they come from the lineage yeah. of Eliyah Kohen. There's a Tan Minan where God was angry at the family of Eli. What does Tawil mean in Syrian? Oh, Tawil is tall, long, high. They gave their name Tawil that the Kilala should not be on them. They should have a long life. They should have a tall life. The curse of Eli should not go on them. It will not go on them. But what was the problem with Eli? Ba'avon asir yada ki mekalelim lahem banav. Because the children were cursing Hashem Barminan. Velo kihava. And he did not rebuke them. And the Navi tells us what the children of Eli were doing in the Beit HaMikdash, in the Mishkan, they were Kohanim, and they were serving. And the Pasuk says, Ubne Eli bene Beliyav. They were children without a yoke of God on them, working in the Kodesh. Lo yad'oet Hashem. The law was, when you bring a korban, the Kohen gets a couple of pieces, and the people get a couple of pieces. He, Kohen eats a little, and they eat a little. And what did they do? They were mafia. Guy broke didn't board in his korban. They took out a jash fork with three prongs on it. They brought it on the thing. They opened it up. They started taking. Came the Kohen. He talk, 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 talk. They fit 16 pieces on the fork. Okay, you take the rest. So I say, well, what about the law? This is the law over here. You want anything? Or not? Take this or get out of here. Like the mafia. And they were eating all stuff that they weren't allowed to eat. And there were laws. You have to sprinkle the blood for this. And I said, we're going to wait till we sprinkle the blood. We're eating it now. We're hungry. And they were stealing all the meat. And they were throwing the vessels. They were banging the vessels in the court. Very bad children. Eli, you see what your children are doing? Tell them, Dachilak, what are you doing? You can't act like this. And he was old man. What am I going to scream at them now? I'm old man already. I don't have the strength. What do you you claim against Eli? Why didn't you rebuke your children? Why don't you tell them they're doing something wrong? Their children are old already. But still, as long as the father is alive, he has the obligation. Be a little tough. This is a suit. Stop it. Wrong. The pasuk speaks clearly. Eli, you're in trouble. 
You didn't rebuke your children. David Melech, who's greater than David Melech? At the end of David Melech, when he's dying, the pasuk says, "Adonia ben Chagit, the son of David, Adonia, mitnasel emor ani emloch." He said, "Look, my father dies. I'm going to tell you, I'm going to be the king." Everybody knew Shlomo was supposed to be the king. Adonia said, "No, I'll be the king." And he went and he made a whole uh, a whole ruckus in order to take the kingdom away from Shlomo Melech, a rebellious son, Adonia. What's the cause of Adonia's rebellion? The pasuk says, "Velo atzabo abid miyamav." His father, that he never gave him musar, never screamed, never scolded him. They more madua kacha asita. Never told Adonia madua kacha asita. When a father sees a son doing something wrong, he's supposed to say madua kacha asita. The child does something that he's not allowed to do. The father can't close his eyes. Hey, he's a kid. He was a, he's a baby. He'll learn like we all learn. Foolishness. If there's a sickness, maybe, oh, it'll heal. Don't worry. It'll get better. It'll, you do it active. You're not passive in this. You're not inactive in this. If there's a problem, you end up. You see the son doing something. The father's obligation. And if you don't, they write it in the Navi for eternity. Adonia rebelled. Why? Because David never said, Madua Kacha Asita. Why are you doing this? And then we see in history some parents that did rebuke. Not to say that Shimon David didn't rebuke, and in this case, he had a lot of children. We see story of Shlomo HaMelech, an unbelievable midrash that tells us the story of Shlomo. The night before the opening of the Beit HaMikdash is amazing. Picture the scene. You can have the Beit HaMikdash for how many thousands of years is Christ there waiting? For the Beit Hamikdash, the first Beit Hamikdash built by Shlomo, an unbelievable and awesome structure, and Kli Yisrael can't wait to open the doors. And that night, it says Shlomo got married. He married the daughter of Paro. He became a convert. She said, "Take it." He married her. That night, there was parties, Shema Berachot, some ha, thousand piece orchestra, dances, and that. The big thing. And then the next morning they want to open the doors to the Beit HaMikdash. They have to bring the Korban Olah, the morning sacrifice. And the door locked. They have to bring the Korban by four hours. They have to bring the Korban by ten o'clock. Seven o'clock the door's locked. Who has the key? Shilomo has the key. Where's Shilomo? Sleeping. He overslept. After the party and the Simcha, he slept late. Imagine that opening day, the people are standing in front of the Beit HaMikdash, and the key is under Shilomo's pillow. What are they going to do? Go wake up the king? You can't wake up the king, Shilomo. Get up! So they go to Bathsheba, his mother. She says, what are you doing? Up? Shilomo, where is he? He's not here. He's sleeping. He has the key. Let us in. we got to do Bathsheba goes to Shilomo. Bathsheba comes in, walks into the palace, walks into his bedroom, takes off a slipper. She's a you know, man already, Shilomo, and starts hitting Shilomo. You lazy bum, get up! They're waiting for you to open the bed, I mean, Dad, What are you doing sleeping over here? Mabiri or He put him against the wall and started bawling him out. You're my son. Everyone's going to blame it on me. Your father was a Sadiq. They're going to say, ah, look at his mother, Bathsheba. This is what Bathsheba produced. David was a Sadiq. This is not uh, from those genes of David. They're going to blame it on me. Everyone made vows. I hope my son will be like Shilomo King one day. And I made a promise to God. I hope my son will be zealous. I hope my son won't be lazy. And this is what happens? 
Oh, what a Musa. Picture the scene. A guy wakes up late. He misses the slide. Yom Kippur. His mother walks up. Huh? You sleep nine o'clock. Shul Kippur. Oh, what a Musa. What a Kilima. Madua Kachasita. And then it says over here. Then it says over here. Shalomo admit it. Shalomo told his mother, Ma, you're right. I have no wisdom. I'm ignorant. Tremendous mistake. That's how you produce a Shalomo Melech. When you have a mother, Batsheva, on top of the kid, hey, why did you get up? What? Because you hear the Musar sometimes, that produces, that produces the good child. The Pasuk says in Tehillim, Estecha kegefen poria biyarkete betecha, banecha kishtile zetim sabib le shulchanecha. Pasuk compares the wife of a person, kegefen. What's a gefen? Gefen is grapes. Ladies like grapes, the wife is like grapes. And the children? The children are like olives. The question is, why is the wife like a grape? And why is the child like an olive? Well, what is the difference between grapes and olives? There's many differences. A grape looks beautiful when it's on the tree. And you could pull it right off the tree. Put it right in your mouth and eat it. It's ready-made. It's delicious. It's not sour, it's sweet. If you want juice, just take the grape, squeeze it right into a cup. Immediately. You have grape juice, put it to your girlfriend. Olive is different. An olive on the tree, when you take it off, it's raw. You can't eat it in that stage. It's bitter, it's hard. It doesn't have a nice appearance. You think the olives that you buy, with the pimento in the middle and all the oil, you think that's how it grows in the tree with the pimentos in it? <laughs> doesn't grow like that. It grows hot and bitter. They process it over a long period of time in order to make it soft and sweet. And then if you want olive oil, you can't just take an olive off a tree and go like this and squeeze it into a jar. They have a press and it takes a long time for them to produce oil. It's a very long job ahead of the person that wants to enjoy an olive. A lady, a person gets married his wife already was trained already. He didn't have to train his wife already. Her parents, his in-laws trained, trained the lady, trained his wife. So the wife comes in like a great. She's made already. She's good. Her me daughter there already. Her character traits. Her way. Her dedicated. He just comes and right away eats the grapes. He enjoys right away. But the children, they're like Zetim. This is raw. They're bitter. You have to toil with them. You have to work them. You have to give them hinuch. You have to put time in it. You have to give them kohod. You have to teach them midot. And only after that, after a while, then these olives become edible. One should never make the mistake and think that his son is a grape. His wife is an olive. Life is a great. She's good. She's made already. There's always room for improvement. It's like there's always good wine, and better wine, and better wine. But generally speaking, the olive is tasty right away. But the olive needs a lot of processing. And one has to realize that when he's teaching his children. This is a hadush from the great rabbi of Yehuda Sadka. Yes, yes, yes. But to teach the son to that's really the father's application. That's where we're hitting it from. In the time of Abraham Avinu, according to one opinion, there was a great man that lived. And that great man was called Iyob. I don't say he's a great man. Torah testifies he was a great man. Ishtam the Yashar, Yere Elohim, Sar Merah. Unbelievable! If Hashem testified, He's Yere Elohim, He's Ishtar Yashar. Yom Sadiq Gamur. And the question is, if he was living in the time of Abraham Abinu, 
So then why does God choose Abraham over Eov? Why does he make Abraham the father of all the Jews? He could have went to Eov. You're the man also. You have the same qualities. And the Mepharshim answer that there was a difference between Eov and Abraham. Because Eov would make parties. Very wealthy man. He would celebrate with his children. And after the parties, it says, Eov would bring sacrifices the next day. And why? He says, because maybe my children during the party got a little drunk. And maybe, they thought things against God. And maybe they even said things against God. So in order to make up a sadiq, the next morning brings korbanot, 30 children, whatever it is, 30 korbanot, in order to make on any bad thoughts that the child had. The problem with the Yob was, and that's after the fact, already you're saying, oh, they probably did it, so let me bring korbanot to make The Yob, where were you the day before? Why weren't you at the party telling the kids, hey, the Motai, my children, be careful. We're enjoying, we're happy. Purify your thoughts, don't say the wrong thing. Only after the fact, oh, if they did it, come on, oh, bring the Qurban for them. Abraham Abinu was not like that. Abraham Abinu was not, the next day, he was not post-dated. Abraham Abinu was that day itself. The man, Yitzavet, Banav, he would tell his children, this is right, it's hot, do this, do that. You go study in the yeshiva, you go here, you go there. Not the, uh, maybe my kids did this, so I'll bring, I'll give some tzedakah, she'el the kaparat b'ni. What the Allah says, in order to be a teacher of Kali Yisrael, you have to be the master mechanech, the master trainer for all time. You have to be on the spot. It's not to let things go, like the Yom did. And Hainuch doesn't start when the child This is unbelievable. Ask a goy. There happens to be some good books written by maybe they go here even on this subject. And you ask the goy, when do you have to start giving a new to your kid? When does it start? I'll tell you, I have a kid uh, four years old, five years old, six years old. And right away we say, oh, I, Ah, uh, now religion. Our religion? Someone would say, Hainuch start the day the kid born in the hospital. Hainuch. Wrong. And you say, oh, of course not. It's when the kid's in the stomach. What the mother eats and what the mother listens to and what the mother watches on television and what the mother thinks of that all affects the child. The second the baby's in the stomach, that's when Hanuk starts. Wrong. Hanuk starts when the mother goes to the mikveh. And when she already is dipping in the mikveh before the child is even conceived. And she is mechavet bode olam. I want to purify myself for my husband in order that Mr. Hashem we can bring. Hanukh begins in the waters of the mikveh, and then the lady comes. Already the halacha says she should look at the dog when she comes out of the mikveh. And she, if you look at the dog on the way out of the mikveh, some poskim day she should dip again. When ladies walk out, they cover their eyes. They shouldn't see the habit standing in front of the mikveh. The first thing. Why? Hanukh. Creating children for Christ land already. You have to mechanech from well, the beginning. And then when they go home and he's with the husband, there's chinuch there, there's machshabot. There's thought. The kid's not even born yet. Nothing started, nothing happened. Chinuch. We hid it from the beginning. Of course, again, once the, the child is born, chinuch starts right away. Just like a tree. You ever look in the street sometimes, those young trees, they're very, very fine, they're very soft. So you can still bend them, and they have the, the rope around them, and they twist them this way so they'll grow towards the sun, and they twist them that way, you can still move them. When the child is young, he's bendable, you can mold them. 
And then after a while, it gets older, it gets hard. So you molded him the right way. But you're going to start molding him when he's older. You start trying to mold an old cedar tree. What happens? <coughs> Timber, the old tree falls down. You don't start a new kid 20 years old, and 25 years old, and 15 years, 10 years old. Too late. Anu has to be from the beginning, from way young. Got a child when he's young should hear in his house. Not music from the goyim. A child, when he's listening to music, should be Jewish music. And the kid should be Ben Minan watching television and all the garbage. That's Hinuch. Hollywood is going to mechanech our children. If we put so much Hinuch from the beginning, even before the child was born, now we're going to let the movie stars, we're going to let that Pikorsim in Hollywood give the Hinuch to our children. Well, everything that comes out of their mouth is naked. Hashkafat Torah. When we read our children books before we go to sleep, what books are we going to read them? There's so much Jewish books. No thing there was a kid know. The kid knows. The kids understand. The kid's mind's like a sponge. They suck in everything. The word is called hashpa'a. What hashpa'a is? Hashpa'a means influence. Yaakov Kamenetsky says, what's the root word of hashpa'a? Some say it comes from the word shefa. You know what shefa means? Abundance. She means the father's filled with so much good and so much so he overflows onto the children. That's one way of explaining hashpa'a. That the father's so packed with goods that it just falls onto the kid. But that's not so, he says. Hashpa'a comes from the word shipua. An incline. A slant. Which means not in everything that the father fills himself up with and then has to overflow, falls onto the child. Everything falls onto the child. It's on its incline. Whatever the father does, the kid will do. It just trickles right down to the son. You have to wait till it overflows. Automatically these things happen. Anything a father or a parent will do, the kid remembers. The kid watches. The kids have unbelievable memories. Their brain is fresh. Not like our brains are ready. They won't have. They remember everything. I went on the boat with my daughter in the summer. Five, six months ago, I asked her tonight, before the year old, what was the name of the dog that we saw on the dock? Cookie! Bingo, she got it. Right? Did, Did you remember? Remember the name? That? On the spot. It's fresh. Everything makes it awesome. Everything makes it. So you can go read your kid a story about Mickey Mouse hugging Minnie Mouse and kissing him and... I, I can read them 613 mitzvot. This is a tefillin. This is a mezuzah. This is a sukkah. This is a. So when the kids are walking in the street, hey, daddy, there's a sukkah. Hey, that is a throw. Is that enough? Everything is understood. You pick up everything. They're like magnet. This is chinuch. This is a Jewish home. When they're young. In the Beta Mikdash. In the Beit HaMikdash, we had what was called the Kodesh Kodashim, and in the Kodesh Kodashim we had the Aron, the Ark, which the Luchot were in, and on the Aron we had Kerubim. You know what the Kerubim, what are they called? Cherubs. Cherubs. There you go. What is that, Kerubim? Now she explains, Kerubim, Dugmat Tinokot. They look like little children's faces made out of gold over here over the Aron one child's face this way one child's face this way facing each other and when God would speak God's voice would come out in between the two children's faces and how do you say this word in Hebrew? Kerubim very nice word right? in another place listen to this in another place in Humash, when Borei Olam threw Adam had he shown out of Gan Eden, the Pasuk says, by Ta Adam, he threw out Adam from, Adam from Gan Eden, by Yishkon Mikedem le Gan Eden et Kerubim. God placed Kerubim in front of Gan Eden to protect it, to make sure nobody goes in. He locked it with Kerubim. How does Rashi explain Kerubim over there? Malachi Habala. Angels of destruction. Very strange. Same word. 
same word kirubim. The one time you explain it to mean babies. Thank you. And another time you explain it to mean angels of destruction. Why was the Hebrew language created like that, where one word can mean two opposite things? The explanation is like this. Because it, depending on the Hanukkah that a father will give his child, if the father takes it seriously, he'll create a son that has the zechut to grow to be a Sadiq, like these Kiruvim that were in the Kodesh Kodeshim, where Shekhinah came from them. Whatever, if the father takes his job of Hanukkah not seriously, and doesn't do his job properly, the children will become Malachi Habala. They will become angels of destruction. All depending on what the father does. The father has an obligation to educate his child. So much so that the great rabbi from Lublin says that a lot of the kilim, the vessels in the Beit HaMikdash were made out of gold. He says, let's say there was a time I they couldn't afford the gold. What are you going to do? You can't afford it. Now we have to collect 300 billion of gold for the better well billion recession we don't have gold what do you do so he says they were able to make everything out of silver except the kirubim when it comes to the kirubim it must be made out of gold I we can't afford it push yourself afford it borrow get make what he says just come and teach a big lesson. When it comes to educating your child, only pure gold. Even if one has a hard time affording it, get silver on the other things. Get a silver vacation. Get a silver maid. Get a silver car. Lower every standards on everything else. But one should never sacrifice the education of his child, no matter how much it costs. Education is expensive. That education. We have a say. You get what you pay for. You pay one cent for education, you're going to get a child with a one cent education. And go look at the children that are coming out of public school today. Go look how many children get shot in public schools today. It's free. Three. Free. So also go build a tent in your backyard and live in the tent. Huh? No rent, no mortgage. Yeah, it's free, it's free. Yeah, okay. It comes to educating your child, one has to go all the way to the best yeshiva. Not the halfway yeshiva, even. He has to go analyze and make a research to the Harvard yeshiva. And I don't mean Harvard College. Some people think it's a big status for their children to go to college. And they'll pay $20,000 a year to send their children. They start collecting for college the day the child is born. Already they open up a, a bank account in the bank. College fund. Why? What do they teach children in college? Boys, your college age. I'm sure it's no different in Panama. But in America, college is a place where they have professional apikorsin that come and pollute the mind of young boys and girls. And just like you sit here tonight to hear the views that I'm saying, I'm reading views from the Torah. And I'm trying to sell you views of the Torah in college. They're not using the Torah as their book. They're using a pikursu. They're opening up all that pikursu. They sit in a class like this with a hundred books written by the Sha'in Kemurin, the biggest gangster. They got all their books open and they're quoting. This garbage said that, and this guy said this, and this guy said that. And you're a dinosaur, and you're an evolution, and you're a this, and you're a that. There's no God. And the kids sing, oh, you got, the guy must know. He got the books. What do you be teaching in Harvard University, Ivy League, Ivy Garbage? What do you be teaching in that school if you didn't know? People get fooled by it. 
and all the liberalism and all the filth in our world, what's the root? Where does it come from? The colleges. Like a church. I'm speaking very strong over here, but I'm speaking the truth. No look how the rabbi spoke against it. That was when colleges were nothing, when they were teaching normal things. Today, a regular college already? Nowhere in the world can you find a co-ed bathroom except in a college. Bathroom. Send a child where well, you're supposed to give them the best chinuch. Send them to places like this. <laughs> and dorming in a college. Do you know how much violence takes place on college? How much rape takes place in college campuses where they have statistics already? If it's a statistic, that means it's something that's. It's something to talk about. How much people became addicts to drugs and to alcohol from colleges? You drink with the boys after, and you start smoking. Send them, the parents run in college. My son goes to college. Hasmus Shaloma, a parent has come bragging, my son's in yeshiva. My son's going to become a Tamil Acha. Oh, they're embarrassed of that. Who do they think is going to become the rabbis for the Jewish people? The Goyim? Whose children will become the future leaders of Kla Yisrael? It should not be an embarrassing thing. A parent should be proud. Baruch Hashem, we have a minhag in our community was a very good minhag. That after high school, the parents send their children to Eretz Israel to study for a year. And that's a very big move. It's a parent that sends his child to go study in Israel for a year. It's a big thing. He shows, this is it. This is what Torah is it. Eretz Israel is our land. Torah is our books. And I want my kid to study intensely. After a religious education in elementary, and after a good high school education, I want more. This is our college. Our college is called the yeshivas. The real yeshivas, not core yeshivas. Some parents are embarrassed. Well, my son, how should become a rabbi? Become a kolel guy? Who's going to support him? The community is going to support it. That's like an embarrassing thing. But when their child is going to study to become a doctor for eight years and the father has to support the kid for eight years, nobody says anything. Nobody tells the guy who's saying they're a doctor, who's going to support you for eight years when you're stuck? Doctor, very nice. Oh, your father's very good. Beautiful. Good work. I'm studying in a college. Well, you know, you're putting pressure on your parents for what? For nothing? For sitting nothing? Reading all that? Why for a doctor they're so happy for a college student not? Does anybody ever complain why we have to support the senators? Every year in April you write a check to the U.S. government to support the senators. You're paying for the senators to sit there in Congress, sitting there making speeches, doing nothing, drinking tea all day. And who's paying for it? Did you ever complain? Oh, I have to pay for these guys to sit on. No, senators are all. Senators are How am I paying for that? I'll pay for the president's salary, the mayor's, all those people do nothing all day long. They pay for that. Oh, when it comes to paying for the yeshiva boys, oh, no. waste of time, nothing garbage. Foolishness. That's a big decision to a parent. Yeshiva education. There was a rabbi. Of Yaakov David Walowski, otherwise known as the Ridvaz. Open up a Talmud Yerusham, the Jerusalem Talmud, and you'll see his interpretation, which made it to the actual page of the Jerusalem Talmud. He lived in 1845, he died in 1913. The Ridvaz, the bottom Tosfot read. And we told the story once of the great that the Vaz, that was father, was not a man of means, was not wealthy, was not well off, hired the top tutor for his son, Rav Chaim Sender, to come and teach this young boy Torah. 
and he would pay you one ruble a month. And times were tough. The father of this rabbi used to make furnaces. And where they were in Russia, that year there was no line, so he wasn't able to make any more furnaces. So in fact, he went out of business. And he owed the tutor for three months pay, three rubles, and the tutor said, sent the letter home with the son, I, I can't do it anymore, I have to eat, I need, I need pay. He said, what are we going to do? They don't have any money. And they owe the tutor three rubles. That night he was in shul and he heard a wealthy man's do- son is getting married, and he's willing to pay six rubles if someone can get him a furnace for the new house that he's building for his son. Rabbi's father comes home and speaks it to his wife. And they decide to take apart their own furnace that they lived with in their house, the furnace that cooked their food and the furnace that heated their house. They took apart their furnace in the freezing cold Russia and sold it to the wealthy man for six rubles. And he gives this child six rubles and says, Go tell the tutor of Chai and Sende, Here's the three back pay, and here's the three for the next three months. Giving him in advance. Go sit and learn Torah. Those are parents. And look what look what produced. It was. That's why you say it. Moser Nefesh. They live in the cold the whole winter. And lastly, a person has a big interest in raising good children. A person will gain immensely if he raises good children. As we know, if the person goes to Olam Haba, he does not die. His soul never dies. If he leaves children in this world or on the right path, Sit and learn Torah. Sit and read. Sit and give sadaqah. Sit and go to classes. And they do the right thing. Every night in Shammai, they make calculations. Give them a tool. You raised such a beautiful son. You went to Minyan this morning. Okay, elevate him. You get the credit. You made the son. You made him who he is. You paid for his education. You made sure he got tutors to teach him the Gemara. You made sure he understood it. You woke him up to shul in the morning. You pushed him. You, you get credit for that. Every single time the child does something. And the father, man, a wealthy man from the United States, once came to a rabbi with his will, last will and testament. He said, Rabbi, I have $30,000 here. When I die, I want 10000 to go to the yeshiva. I want 10000 to go to the court holding. And the last 10,000 cash I want to be buried with me. The rabbi said to Yeshiva, we have no problem. The court will leave, we'd be very happy to accept your 10,000. But could you explain to me why you want to be buried with $10,000? He starts sighing. He says, Rabbi, what should I tell you? I have six children. They're all rebellious. They're all not on the path. They don't follow anything. They don't do anything. I'm thinking to myself, I'm going to die now. What's going to happen when Mashiach comes? We're going to be resurrected. I'm going to come out. Maybe it's going to be a freezing cold day. And I'm going to be cold. My children won't even buy me a sweater if they see me. So I need this $10,000 to buy me a cup of tea and a shirt. The rabbi smiled. He says... If those six children are going to bury you, they're going to bury you in a way that you're never going to come back for Tariyat and Nitiv, so don't worry about it. Which means if you raise children like that, <laughs> don't worry about it. <laughs> you're not going to be called your Tariyat and Nitiv because... Uh, so it's a big zikhut. I don't know how true that is or not. But that was the Musad he gave to him. 
And we'll end with the parable of Ben Ishai. Basuk says, Sadiq katamar yifrah. A Sadiq is like a tamar, like a date tree, like a palm tree. Bifrawah rishaim kimu'as. Rishaim are like grass. And Ishai says, Why is Sadiqim like a palm tree? Why is Rishaim like grass? What's using Mashab? He says, There was two men, they were walking down the street, and they were gamblers, I like to bet on everything. And they walked by a palm tree. One guy tells his friend, I'll bet you a thousand dollars on the table. Who can guess how tall this tree is? A thousand bucks? Takes a thousand, matches it. Guy takes one look at it, sizes it up, says it's ten feet. Ten feet? Okay. Other guy says, no, it's not ten feet, it's eleven feet. They take out the ruler, go to the top of the tree, to the bottom, ten feet. Guy says, I get it. Behold it. Guy walks to the tree, the second guy takes a shovel and digs a little under the tree. And he notices that the tree, the palm goes down to the ground another foot. He says, You forgot that part, that's 11. It takes the 2,000. Guy says, Why beat me? He got me, this guy. Says, All right, now I know a trick. He's walking with another friend, this guy. The guy who lost the bet. Two gamblers again. Guy wants to make back some money. He sees some grass. Tells the guy, "Want to bet? I bet you two thousand. You could size up how tall that grip. Two puts a two thousand right in. Both take a look at it. One guy says, half a foot. Uh, so the guy smiles. And a half a foot. It's a foot and a half. They take the measure. They measure it. Half a foot." Guy takes the fourth out. Hold it! Not so fast, buddy. He thinks he's going to get him. Shovel. He went through this already. Experience. Shovel's underneath the ground. He sees the grass under the ground is only three inches. He says, what's one in the hand? It's nothing. Takes the 4,000 and goes away. That's the difference between a day tree, a palm tree, and grass. Palm tree has roots. So even when it dies... Something left underneath the ground and will grow right back again. One that leaves good children, even if he's gone already, the roots are there, they'll grow right back. The shaim are like grass. Person leaves children, but menan. When the grass goes, nothing, a couple of centimeters underneath the ground does not have the power to even grow back again. Gentlemen, Boys, remember this class. You're young. Make a tape. Take it back to Panama with you. You listen to it when you get older. You remember the big responsibility that is incumbent upon all of us. Enuch, Adua, Kacha, Asita. Why did you do this? Let us not take this as a small job. Let us realize the importance of this paramount this awesome responsibility that lies upon us.